Now we will put the perspectives and insights from youth work practitioners at the center stage. And uh, each of the four panelists here, in their own way and in uh, their own context, um, are um, since quite some time engaged in dedicated action to make the youth work sector more sustainable and in supporting young people to take sustainable action. So we are very, very grateful to have them here today and I'm also grateful that they want to share their um, stories and their insights with us. Um, and, and we hope that um, what they tell you will also help us to move the discussion from theory to practice. Um, and before I give the floor to each of them to briefly present themselves, um, I have two uh, small practical announcements to make. First, throughout the panel, we will also give you, the audience, um, the opportunity to voice your opinion on some of the issues we're going to discuss. And how will we do this? Well, we will be using a tool you probably all know by now after two years of corona and uh, digital um, uh, cooperation. We will be using Mentimeter for this. So please keep your smartphone ready um, well, because we will be asking you questions as well. We value participation in all ways. Um, and second, at the end of the session, there is a bit of room for Q&A. So if you have burning questions, please um, note them down um, and make sure you ask them at the very end. So then we will move to, uh, well, a small introduction round of our four panelists. And yeah, here you have the four names listed. And the first um, of the panelists who will introduce herself is actually Esther. And I will show presentation here. So Esther, please take the floor. Hello. You can take the microphone off oh. if that's more comfortable. How does it go? <laughs> Just pull. Okay. Yeah. So um, yes, uh, hello, my name is Esther. I come from Spain. Um, I'm a freelance eco trainer. I like to call myself eco trainer because I train on environmental issues, but I also try to transmit the values of uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, I'm a founding manager of Asociación Biodiversa, so this is um, an organization that I founded, co-founded 10 years ago. Um, it's um, for um, educating on environmental topics, um, young people, youth workers, and also adults, actually, so, well, yeah, youth workers. Um, and I manage uh, EU projects uh, within the organization. So it's uh, our, our main funding line is uh, Erasmus Plus and uh, other types of EU grants. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, so that's uh, Asociación Biodiversa, that's the logo. It's an orchid which disguises as a bee. Uh, so it's a nice um, way to represent biodiversity and uh, the work that we do. Uh, we, uh, our like second like um, title is uh, we conserve nature through education and awareness raising, um, and as I said before, it's through uh, through EU programs and uh, it's for adults. Uh, you have the our our website there if you want to know more. And next slide, please. So that's me personally. I'm a nature lover, so I do this because it's my passion, not because uh, it's easy to find a job in it or because it's economically profitable. It's not. <laughs> so uh, I really do it because it's my passion. I also love hiking in the mountains. Uh, and uh, I'm an environmental activist in every sense. So, uh, I'm, um, so I've participated in actions with Young Friends of the Earth. I have led uh, also actions with uh, WWF. Um, and uh, I also do online activism. Um, yeah, and now I am more in the part of, um, how to say, um, helping young people to, uh, to become more active and, and like, um, more effective in their actions. Yeah, and the next uh, slide, um, you will see something that I produced uh, very recently for Salto Participation and Inclusion. They asked me to write an article about, um, well, whatever I could contribute. And I decided because I have been um, developing European projects uh, for 10 years, uh, always with this uh, sustainability focus in mind, I decided to write an article on, with tips on how to organize a sustainable um, project. 
Um, and then, well, I'm very impressed by the work that was presented before uh, by Neringa. It, this is a very simplified version of that. So your tool is, is really, really great. This is more like a environmental sustainability for dummies, maybe, no? So like a really like a starting point with 11 very simple tips. But the article actually goes more in depth into each one of these. So um, yeah, that's my, one of my contributions. And that's it uh, for an introduction. Thank you. Thank you. You can pass the mic to Finn. Um, hi, my name is Finn. I'm here to represent uh, Pulse Transition Network. In, uh, in English, that would be Pulse uh, Transition Network. So we're a network of cultural organizations. And when I say cultural, I mean uh, cultural agents, meaning arts, heritage organizations. Um, social cultural work, but also youth work and subsidized media. Uh, we're an organization that resides in Flanders, and we try to connect those organizations, professionals who want to work on sustainability, both within their own organization as within society, um, and we connect them so they can join forces and we get like an, an efficiency gain in, in, in what they do. Because for most of the organizations, uh, as far as Flanders goes, and I think it, it's, also, it's the same for, uh, for elsewhere in Europe, um, sustainability and, and caring for each other and the planet is part of the values of most organizations. Uh, but sustainability, sadly enough, is not a core uh, task for these organizations. So by putting them together around the same table and having them connect, uh, it's easier them for them to work on these uh, issues. And why do we think it's important? First of all, greening their or own organizations, but we also believe that cultural, uh, in general, has a role to play in the whole transition story. It's not only the hard themes, but it's also the um, the soft themes, getting the the environmental friendly, the transition, the the the, the just social just transition into the hearts and the heads of uh, the people, and it's behavioral change. So that's what culture is very uh, effective in. Um, how do we, where did we, well, it's uh, interesting to know we started within the arts. It was a bunch of art organization um, and artists that said let's join forces and then the, the network quickly grew to the whole cultural sector, uh, adding um, heritage, adding uh, social cultural work and later on adding youth work and uh, the subsidized media. So youth work is... Um, uh, a sector that was only added about four years ago, but they, in, in essence, they do the same as the other organizations. Um, we try to work as, as cross-cultural as possible, so we rarely work with youth work exclusively. We try to connect these organizations over the boundaries of the different sectors. And we do that mostly by having uh, some kind of help desk. It's uh, our matchmaking uh, uh, facility. The organizations can connect with us and uh, ask for things they need, information they need, practices they need, and we try to connect them with organizations within our network that have this knowledge, that have this experience, so they can learn learn from each other. Uh, we organize uh, different events, both online and offline, so they can physically and digitally connect. We also have our own um, exchange program written, a uh, platform, not program, uh, written. Uh, think of uh, as an, uh, an online forum where they can ask questions. And we do uh, some projects with our, with our network, but mostly we try to instigate um, organizations to, to develop their own project within the, the members of our network. Uh, and then a little tiny part about me, I have a, a youth work background, I used to be a volunteer in a youth club and then I worked for a couple of years in uh, for Format, which is the Federation of Open Youth Work and Youth Clubs in Flanders. And um, within Pulse, uh, we are a very small organization, so everybody does a little bit of everything. We're only four. Um, but my main focus uh, that is exclusive from the other uh, team members is uh, the youth work sector. There. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Christina Thomas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And um, I am the Officer for Sustainability at the Regional Youth Council of North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, 
<clears throat> we are an association that consists of 25 youth associations coming from very different perspectives, very different backgrounds. Um, so therefore we are an umbrella organization. So it's maybe important to know that um, we do not work directly within youth work itself or with young people themselves, but we are rather representatives of the interests of young people and youth associations. So this is really what our main concern is to uh, represent the interests of young people towards politicians, towards the media and uh, society in general. Oh, I think it's already running, right? <laughs> um, yeah, we have different uh, departments, different working fields, ranging from migration, integration, um, education, democracy, uh, youth policy, of course, and obviously sustainability, <laughs> which is the department that um, I'm responsible for. And in this, um, just seeing if this works, yes. Um, in this field, in this department, we are currently on a journey to shrink our ecological footprint and to enlarge our ecological handprint. So our influence on societal structures, on political structures, in order to make them more sustainable. And um, yeah, this is uh, the baseline of what we do. Maybe a last thing to add is that the, the basic of our, the basis of our sustainable work is happening within the youth associations themselves who do a lot of education for sustainable development. And um, yeah, this is uh, the basis of our work. Thank you. Hi, that's uh, me. <laughs> I'm uh, Fien from Globlink, I'm from Belgium. I work for Globlink, it's a national youth service um, with a scope of Flanders and Brussels. We work with youngsters, I'm a, a youth worker. Um, we see youngsters as people between 16 and 26 years. Um, in their spare time, we try to reach them. Um, and we aim as an organization for a sustainable, righteous uh, world. And how we do it, we like to um, give competences to youngsters to develop power and empower them really um, to make sustainable choices. Um, we do it in all kinds of ways. We do it on a local, supra-local, national and international level. Um, so I can keep talking about it, but I will uh, show you four examples if all goes well. Oh, that's the movie, I couldn't show it. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is actually an example of um, a local context um, where we worked on mobility. In Gerardsbergen, its name is uh, famous for uh, the cycling course. <laughs> um, and we worked with the methods of a bucket list. Um, nobody was dying, but they had like the chance to um, wrote down 16 actions on things they wanted to do with mobility on their local context. They did all the actions, for example, um, they wanted to ban the cars uh, in the city center, so we did with like 100 youngsters, was pretty cool. Um, and then really important, um, afterwards, we get to talk with uh, the, the, the local decision makers to make sure that what the youngsters thought, their voices, their opinions, got to the local decision makers. Um, and actually, it wasn't just talking, it was action, and it was like a sustainable way of talking about a sustainable topic. All right. Another one on a supra-local level. Um, this one is TriAct. We always find cool names for our projects. Um, and this topic was about um, equal rights and non-discrimination. Um, and so we always set up a um, project with the youngsters. Um, and um, actually the action of this project will happen in two weeks. And they thought like, okay, there are a lot of prejudgments about um, people in general. Um, so what they're going to do in Ghent, they're going to build a wall with all the prejudgment that people have about other people. Um, and then they're going to build, uh, build the wall and then they're going to break it down. Um, so we always have like cool actions that the youngsters found themselves. We're just like, we guide them through the process. Um, but so a whole other example uh, of mobility, but uh, equally cool. Um, yeah. Climate. 
another topic that has a lot of links with youngsters. Um, this uh, project is called Road to Glasgow. As we know, uh, within a few weeks, uh, the COP in Glasgow is going to happen. But we thought, like, okay, um, they're all like adults who are going to talk over there, but why not take the voice of the youngsters with them? Um, so we made up uh, a track, um, Road to Glasgow. Um, and we uh, worked on recommendations that the adults should take with them. So what did we do? We made like all the recommendations. We put them in stencils. The youngsters did it. Uh, and then we did like a whole big action in Flanders and Brussels where um, with ecological uh, um, chalk, um, they uh, spread the recommendations in different kind of cities. Really cool to so make sure that everybody know that, for example, um, what they thought to bring to the roads to Glasgow. And then, what do I have it with me? Ah, that's a movie. Don't have time for that. <laughs> um, but at last, we also do like international uh, project. This was one of the youngsters who participated in a resilient exchange very important topic, resilience, um, where we did like um, a partnership with Garocha in Catalonia, and we worked a whole uh, week around the topic, um, like what can youngsters do in a world that changes the whole time? How can you be resilient in it? So we worked towards an action, and these youngsters, they made like um, a whole website about how they can be resilient. So I tend to speak a lot, so I will, <laughs> what? That was the group, that was the last one. Okay, then I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Finn. Thank you also for making us feel the nice youth work vibe in your examples. Um, good, as an opening question uh, to all of you, um, what strikes me is, well, that you're all coming from different contexts and, and maybe the state of affairs on uh, sustainability is quite different in, in all those contexts. Um, but can you tell us a bit more about like, what, uh, what the state of affairs is in your context and like, is there a sense of urgency when it comes to uh, sustainability? Um, is there this sense that the youth work sector needs to do something on this? Um, okay, I um, see people nodding. Well, Christina, you can go first. Yeah, I can uh, make the start. So, um, Considering the question, is there a sense of urgency? I would answer with yes and no at the same time. Um, because there is definitely a lot of movement, there's a lot of um, projects going on and many, many youth associations picking on that topic and really pushing it forward. Um, we see that in our organization as well. Um, so there's definitely a lot of uh, things happening and also, you know, the topic being addressed with the urgency needed. Um, on the other side, of course, um, uh, you know, uh, considering that um, our youth associations have a very, very wide range of backgrounds and um, come from really different fields like sports, music, um, labor union youth, and uh, you know, the traditional nature-bound movements, and um, from really a, a lot of different um, perspectives. There are, of course, some who don't really see a connection to the point of sustainability. So, um, yeah, and also maybe m might not prioritize it due to a lack of resources and um, stuff like that. So, um, it's kind of a mixed answer for yes. us, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, Finn, for the Belgian context, is this, is it quite similar or is it different? Yeah, I, I cannot speak for uh, for the young people as we work with the organizations, mm -hmm. but within the organizations we work with, first we saw a growth in the organizations that reach out to us, uh, that participate in uh, the activities we organize or in the questions they ask uh, and the drive they have to become sustainable themselves. That is That sense of urgency is really present in uh, the organizations we work with. Um, and they, they also feel that there is, um, there is their responsibility to do something on, on, a, on a societal level uh, to activate um, the, the, the young people they work with. Um, but that's a, a little bit more hesitant uh, at the moment. If we have the, the feeling that they first would like to become sustainable themselves as well. Uh, which is, uh, mm -hmm. as mentioned before in the previous presentation, which is a process, uh, constant asking and questioning yourself and changing uh, all the time. So 
there is no end point in being, being sustainable, so might as well just start now. Um, we had, uh, we initiated the youth work part of our network about four years ago now. Um, and at the time, uh, one of the goals was to be activist. Um, that plan kind of backfired. Uh, but after the, 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 I think we'll return on the topic later on in yes, the discussion as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, after the, the climate marches of youth, uh, the, the youth movement itself, not the youth work organizations, um, it has kind of returned. So there is a willingness mm -hmm. to do okay. something about it. And the sense of urgency is there. Yeah. yeah. We'll touch upon that point later, but maybe we can hear Esther. I I've heard already before the session that you're very busy nowadays to, in your project. So that's maybe a sign that mm, there is yeah. a sense of urgency. So maybe I can not talk that much about the Spanish context mm -hmm. because my, my, my work is more international. Uh, so as a freelance eco trainer, I can say that I've never seen anything like this before. Like there's so many projects right now um, related to environmental education, upskilling of youth workers on uh, um, on sustainability matters um, and also interest uh, from the side of uh, the Sal Salto agencies and uh, national agencies to, to tackle this, uh, these uh, issues much more. So I, I am definitely feeling that, uh, that this is something that is, is very popular right now. I don't know if it's just a trend or, or it will continue, um, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yes, for me it's, uh, it's been a, a big, big change um, I mm -hmm. can really notice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Youngsters, um, there are like a lot of youngsters who are like in front of the climate strikes and they're like really on with the topic. But on the other hand, I also think that there are like youngsters who are mm, not on board with it. They're like, um, it's, it's due to all of reasons we already heard, they are not participating in the sustainable topic. Um, so to me, that's like, um, confrontating and it's like a challenge to also reach them so what we as global link like to do is like to empower and to encourage like every um action that has been has been done is it in a local context that somebody says like okay we're gonna stop eating meat perfect if you want to organize your own climate strike also fine but the participation ladder to me is flat and we should encourage all kinds of activism. Is it online? Is it offline? Is it like passive? Is it like active? All participation is, is right. So I think we should encourage them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that brings us to a first Mentimeter question. And now I'm looking for Darko to assist me technically and also looking to you to take your smartphones or computer and simply go to www.menti.com if I'm correct. And then Dark will launch a first question because we would also like to know from you in your context how you would describe the relationship between youth work and youth-led climate activism. Aha, voila. And there we should see the results coming in. So the code for the Menti is on the top of the screen. It's 4747. Uh, 85813 and the question is how would you describe the relation between youth work and youth-led climate activism so and you can choose between uh, three options um, so either the youth work field has been supportive taken a supportive role um, or um, has not taken a supportive role or it's complicated, like in any type of relationship, there is always a third option. <laughs> and this appears to be a popular one. And we wait a little more, but it's quite clear what the outcome is going to look like. Okay, and then looking at those results, we can move back to the panel and, um, well, ask the same question to you. You couldn't vote, but you can just express your opinion here for, to, hear it, to hear it from all of us. Um, so, 
yeah, in your context, how did youth work respond to the, the youth activism, which was so visible from uh, 2019 on? Um, and also, do, would you consider this as an, an adequate response? Um, was it the right response according to you? Or should the response have looked differently? Um, maybe we can start with Finn now. Yeah, I think you can add something. That we were just blown away by the youngsters and they were just like taking it in their own hands and they were just doing it. We as an organization, or as my feeling, we kept on talking about all the Agenda 30, uh, 2030, about the SDGs, blah, 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 blah. But the youngsters, they just went on the streets. And now we're like, as organization, like, hmm, which role should we play in this part? To me and to as Globelink, we didn't want to steal their thunder and we want to give them the spotlight. So we didn't really participate in, them, in it. We supported them like literally by giving them coffee and tea while the, they're doing the, the climate strikes and they were like, okay, if you want to, um, if you need a place to stay, you can stay with us, um, like really support them. But we didn't actively participate in the climate strikes. And I don't know yet what my feeling is about it exactly. Um, yeah, for us, um it is a little bit the same, or at least I would say I can join in on the majority of the voters with the uh, phrase, it's complicated. Because in a way, um, you know, the Fridays for Future movement, for example, it really served as a wake-up call for us, and it really, um, you know, um, just led to more um, power, I would say, in the sustainability area of our work, um, led us to make stronger demands uh, in our resolutions, for example. So it really was um, kind, of, kind of a catalyst and pushed us forward. But at the same time, it is complicated um, considering the structures of our youth work and our youth associations, because um, like I said before, we are an, an umbrella organization um, consisting of youth associations and in German that would be Jugendverband uh, which is like a specific term that um, is like a concrete definition so you have to fulfill certain criteria in order to uh, be a member organization of us and looking at a movement like Fridays for Future um, they wouldn't fulfill those so they would have to have a certain amount of members and um, and articles of association, so like a statute and a certain tradition. And um, yeah, so this is maybe also something that we should think about. Is there maybe a way that we can find another way of membership or another way of um, supporting these groups? Because at the moment, they are kind of excluded from our structures because of this, um, yeah, this, this structural definitions. Finn. I'd like to, to add what uh, Finn uh, said. Um, I still remember those discussions vividly with like all the young people in the street on TV uh, claiming, claiming the climate. Um, and the discussions with the youth work were like, geez, why, why can't we do what they are doing spontaneously? We've been trying so hard to put it on the agenda and failing, and these kids just do this. Uh, decentralized organizations going to the streets. Um, and at the end of the discussion, we, we just said, okay, let, let's, not, let's not indeed steal their thunder. It's, it's their thing. If we put our backs into it and help them, it will it will take away of of the, that power because politicians and adults will say, see, it's not the, the children that organize it. It's not the, 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 the teenagers and the students that are organizing it. It's those professional organizations behind it. It's the unions, it's uh, cultural organizations, it's the youth movement. Uh, so in the end, youth work in Flanders didn't, didn't participate. I don't think they even uh, called out to other young people to join the marches or to join the strikes publicly. Uh, behind the scenes they did, but publicly they didn't because they, they wanted it to, 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 to keep it pure. Um, there were organizations that supported them, um, as in uh, practically like Globlink, they indeed distributed tea and coffee uh, when the, 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 the students and the, the strikers passed by in the street. Uh, there were organizations that gave them material, uh, such as uh, 
uh, how do you say, it? well, trucks. I was going to say trucks for the sound installation and, and, and um, yeah. But things have changed. I think now, uh, when you see, for example, uh, with the last climate strike, which was yesterday, uh, which we all, all three of us missed uh, <laughs> because of obvious reasons. Because we were um, on the train. <laughs> youth work is involved. Uh, Hero Nacional, which is one of the biggest youth, which is the biggest youth, youth movement in Flanders, they were actively involved with the organization of, of this thing. So they're, they're picking up new roles and new, um, new positions, which is good, mm -hmm. I think. As to what position would you choose? <laughs> um, well, it is complicated, but I think I would go for uh, yes, uh, youth work has responded. It could have maybe responded a little bit better or, or a little bit more. And in many cases, yes, it, it's, it's also what, what uh, they were saying, that the structures sometimes don't, um, per, don't permit fast reactions. But for example, me as a freelancer or, or as a, a manager of a grassroots organization, I do have more flexibility. And, uh, and I have uh, worked, for example, uh, with with, um, International Young Nature Friends and uh, Youth and Environment Europe. Both uh, networks have uh, managed to organize trainings on uh, youth participation and uh, for upskilling uh, climate mm -hmm. activists and so on. So um, I've seen a lot of um, projects which, uh, which are really filling up the needs of, of young people right now. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> Something I also learned from your responses is that youth workers were in full admiration actually for what young people were um, accomplishing by going to the streets. What can the youth sector learn from this, from this youth activism? Yeah, okay, Finn, you can go. Yeah, well, I want to take this one. Uh, one of the, the main reasons why uh, the, the youth network we were working with uh, didn't uh, set up their own actions, which was the idea from the start was the fear of greenwashing. The idea of, uh, now we cannot claim that, that we want a sustainable future when we as an organization are not working sustainably yet. So let's first become sustainable. Whereas these young people in the street, they say, Okay, the system is fucked. We've all we've we've all been been um, uh, misled. We need a new system. We need new ways of organizing our society. But we function in this society, so no, we're not perfect either. But we do want to make the transition towards that society. So mm -hmm. listen to us, help us. We're all in this together. And I think youth work can learn from that by doing exactly the same. Acknowledging you're not perfect because you live in a non-perfect system, but wanting to drive towards a perfect society. Mm -hmm. Other lessons to share? Yeah. Fine. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like they were so bold. It, it was like we, and I think that's, that also has benefits, but as organizations, as policymakers, we keep on talking in a structural way. It's a long process. We all do it like in a very, very slow process. But then the youngsters show that just like, it isn't that difficult. You can just claim the streets, um, ask for recommendations. Like they, they just did it. They were as creative as we has never been as a youth sector. So when I think like, what can we learn from them? Draw a line. They draw a line like, okay, to this and no point further from now, it's action time. So maybe we should take more action as a youth sector. Mm -hmm. Christina. I would agree that the focus on action is really something that is admirable and um, that we can learn a lot from. Also, uh, something that was previously mentioned, the amount of people they are able to mobilize, of young people they are able to mobilize is just, um, yeah, insane. And I think in, in, in many um, regions of, of uh, the youth sector, especially when it comes to a more meta <laughs> political level, um, those organizations don't really uh, get through to the young people themselves. So that's something that we can learn um, from them to better mobilize the actual target audience. And something else that I personally find very impressive is just this level of global interconnection that they have. And um, yeah, to, to work as such a global uh, movement is really, um, yeah, just personally for me, I think a very impressive uh, thing that we can learn from. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, I would like to move to another uh, topic very central uh, to youth work. Um, well, a central value in, in all types of youth work practices is youth participation. Um, as youth work wants to enable young people and empower them to participate meaningfully in society. Um, but what can, can youth work do actually to strengthen youth participation on climate related matters? It has already been touched upon in the previous sessions. Um, how can youth work amplify young people's voice in the political sphere? Um, can you give also examples from your own practices? Um, Esther? Yeah, so so I think one thing uh, that youth work and youth workers can do is um, recognizing the, the need for, for young people to, uh, to maybe have some help on, on addressing climate issues and, uh, and uh, getting their voices heard by, by the politicians and uh, other stakeholders. So basically what I see is um, youth organizations as a way to channel European funding uh, into young people. So um, we can develop projects that uh, fulfill their needs and wishes, let's say, um, and that way um, give them more capacity uh, and more resources to uh, develop actions and to have conversations with uh, uh, decision makers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, as you said, the, the first step is just hear, listen to young people. Um, you cannot talk about youngsters without talking with them. So, um, yeah, that's basically step one. Um, and we use as a framework education for sustainable development. Um, and we have like different steps that we take in them. Like for example, um, new knowledge. You cannot talk about SDGs to youngsters without explaining like the basic steps of what are the SDGs are. But that's not enough. You have to go to like, what's the link with those topics? Um, and surprisingly, youngsters have an opinion about everything. <laughs> it's just, um, to us, to youth workers, to empower them and to use methods. Um, and they have to be very playful, very creative to really reach for the youngsters. And then, uh, so important, um, don't just talk with them, but go into action. And those action, I already showed a few examples, it can be anything. Um, it can be a climate strike, but it can be like an open letter, letter to um, one of the poli policy makers. Um, it can be like a public action. Um, I think it's, it's important to work customized. Listen to youngsters, what, what do they need? And as a youth worker, take a step back and just guide the process. Um, make it about them, don't make it about you. Um, yeah, talking about the aspect of youth participation, this is really one of the, the main topics that we have and the main demands that we have to um, demand youth participation in political decision making processes and there are like certain measures that we um, suggest are taken. First one would be to bring young people into direct contact with um, political decision makers. So we as a youth council are, for example, pretty close to ministries anyway, so we have contacts there that we can use. Uh, just two weeks ago, we actually went to the Ministry for Youth and the Ministry for the Environment in our uh, federal state in Germany and brought young people directly together with them. That was a great example. Whoops. <laughs> um, there are my notes. Um, yeah, and secondly, on a more structural level, yeah, <laughs> thank you. On a more structural level, um, we demand um, uh, a youth strategy actually for our um, state. There is a youth strategy already existing in the, you know, federally in Germany. And uh, maybe to, to shortly explain what, what do we mean with youth strategy, that would mean really like a, um, you know, structural, the implementation of, of, of instruments that enable a structural and efficient youth participation. So one of those instruments could be a youth check for example, which is which would mean that it would be obligatory to uh, check the impact that certain laws have on young people. So that's just one instrument, uh, for example. 
And um, yeah, that's another thing that we demand, a youth strategy. And lastly, <laughs> last topic, um, thinking about, you know, one of the most basic uh, fundamental rights that we have in a democracy is voting. And uh, in this case, we demand to, to lower the voting age at least to 16 in Germany, because uh, I guess it's, it's, it's probably the same in every other European country, but in the federal elections, in the state elections, the voting age is 18, and uh, we think as young people are mostly affected by the climate crisis, um, it shouldn't be the case that they can decide who is making decisions for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, a quite important element uh, in, in moving towards a more sustainable society and youth work sector is that youth work organizations lead by example, that they practice what they preach. What have been uh, actions uh, that have taken place in your organizations to make your own uh, organization, your own working modus more sustainable? Um, I see Finn smiling. I know you have an opinion on this. <laughs> Uh, well, for us, it, it was easy. We were created as an organization on sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, it was from the start obvious that we were going to work sustainably. Um, actually, we only, <laughs> only developed last year, we developed a policy paper how to act sustainably within, sustainable within our own organization. But none of the things that we wrote down on paper were new. They were just things that we already did. Um, mm -hmm. So it ranges from um, the catering to mobility, where we put our money, uh, the bank, um, insurances we have, the, the way we try to uh, create fair pay towards the employees, but also to the people we work with. Um, well, basically in all aspects of what we do. On the other hand, for us, it's, it's fairly easy because we are a very small organization, so our yeah. ecological impact is rather small. Um, so we don't have to tackle challenges like uh, big housing uh, or big infrastructure and, and energy efficiency there because it's, it's not, not mm -hmm. present. Yeah, okay. Yes? Yeah, very similar to his case. Uh, in my organization, from the very beginning, we've been operating as sustainable as, uh, as we know. And, um, and yes, we also, in our case, we also, we, as we organize uh, international mobility projects, uh, that's um, a bit more challenging because how do you m make it coherent to make a lot of people move to one different place uh, to talk about sustainability? Uh, so, so this was maybe the biggest challenge um, and what we do is we basically try to um, encourage sustainable transportation. Um, now thanks to the, the new uh, Erasmus Plus um, um, yeah, the, um, program guide where um, finally green travel is, uh, is uh, encouraged and is um, um, funded because before um, we really had to uh, cover and more expensive travels with uh, money from the organization because uh, yes it's as you all know it's normally cheaper to fly than to go by train um, and so um, <laughs> if uh, if the Erasmus plus program is given a, a certain amount for traveling uh, people always try to spend less of course so um, well this was the the biggest challenge basically what we do is uh, um, yeah we encourage sustainable travel and we um, reimburse the full amount of the travel if the travel has been uh, green let's say um, and then we we make um, we establish a contest for the most sustainable travel so like that we got some participants actually uh, coming by bicycle to the from like other very far away countries um, yes um, this mm -hmm. is one of the things we do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Oh, okay. Finn can go first. Um, yeah, I think it's for Globlink. It's it's rather similar, um, but we noticed like what's for us um, as, as so simple. Like for example, vegetarian meals. It isn't like in partnerships. Um, it's like sometimes really discussions uh, about it. But I think practice what you preach means to us like keeping your food down and. Worst case scenario, the partnership doesn't happen. Um, or like, for example, on, on, on travel matter, we have a no flying pol policy. If it's not possible, then we don't do the partnership. But it, it sounds really easy, but it's, it takes a bit of courage to, to keep your foot down. So, but I think that's the only way to 
to, to make people believe that we're sustainable because that's a big part of it. Yeah, in, in our case, um, we, we actually have an, a resolution that was passed in 2019 uh, that gave us the obligatory goal to become climate neutral. So <laughs> this is uh, the way we are currently on, which is of course challenging. Um, but what we did uh, in the context of this was we started calculating uh, the emissions of not only our office and our events, but also all uh, of our youth associations, offices and events, which is uh, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty uh, complicated process and also of course had its um, mm -hmm. difficult sides. And we are being accompanied by a climate research institute of Wuppertal um, with this. And they have analyzed our data now. They have given us concrete measures on what, what to do. And uh, yeah, this is currently where we're, where we're at. And it um, feels like we are just ready to now really get started. Yeah. 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 And what kind of incentives um, would help you to drive the process further? Um, because uh, on the one hand, uh, the process is already is maybe mainly driven also by values of, of youth workers and values of organizations, not so much by external uh, pressure or incentives. But what kind of incentives would help also other organizations to, to move forward, this forward? Well, for me, the, the, what I was mentioning before, the fact that green travel is now on the program yeah. guide of Erasmus Plus, it's like a lot of people I'm imagining that are reading this and they are thinking of green travel for the first time in their lives. They have mm -hmm. never considered this before and now they might consider it because yeah. it's there. Um, but I would go beyond that. It's Now it's only green travel, but why not uh, give some extra money to those projects which are also sustainable in, in, in other ways? Uh, with the food that they provide or with the, even the content of the training or I don't know. Um, I think mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot uh, that can be done in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Finn? Yeah, what we see with uh, the organizations we work with, it's always the same. There is very much a willingness to, to work on sustain, becoming sustainable as an organization, uh, both ecological, economical and social, but it's mostly a uh, matter of, of funding, uh, means of being able to do it, making, freeing up uh, work time to actually write the plan, investigate what is the best to do and implement the thing. Um, as far as Flanders goes, I see it in a lot of policy papers, like the general policy plans of organizations for the coming few years, but there's no budget connected to it when they ask for subsidies because it, it isn't included in the possibilities to ask funding for it. Mm -hmm. So that would, be, that would be a big incentive, or at least an enabler, not maybe an incentive, because the incentive is the intrinsic drive to become sustainable. Yeah. I don't think they need the motivation to become sustainable. They need the means to be able to do it. Yeah. Um, one, one incentive that I am just noticing right now in the process that we are is that um, it kind of also lies within the process of trying to, to be climate neutral itself because very, very often um, I think we, <laughs> we all share this feeling, uh, climate activism or sustainability activism can really feel like running against the wall and uh, falling on deaf ears um, for many times, especially when we work like on a political or structural level. And the very interesting thing is also for, for young people when they uh, see you know, concrete measures that they can take in order to become climate neutral, there's this feeling of self-efficacy, like I can do something, I can shape my surroundings and um, I am an active shaper of my environment and that's something that's really empowering, I think. So um, yeah, sometimes uh, the incentives maybe lies in the <laughs> climate neutrality itself. So. Mm -hmm. That's something that I am currently also feeling. Yeah. And maybe as an adjustment, um, a lot of organization has to do the same exercise. Um, think about the travel, the, the catering, but like also like be sustainable as an organization. But I, I do have the feeling in, in Flanders and, and also beyond that it's like everybody just does the exercise on their own, but which is ridiculous if you think about it. Um, why not cross the borders and, and do, for example, what Pulse does? They, they try to connect three uh, sectors who are like already has so much connections, um, but you actively take that role. But I think 
each of us as an organization has to share the good examples, be connected in, in which way, whatever. Um, uh, open source is one of the values of the transition. Mm -hmm. So it also means opening up the plans you make and how you do it and sharing them. Yeah. It's so simple. Yeah, well, this brings me to a next question. Is there, in your opinion, sufficient cooperation and exchange within the youth sector on this topic? So, uh, Are we talking Europe or? Uh, both. So within your own context and then on a different level uh, within Europe? In Flanders, there's, there's, there's definitely a willingness. When we look at the, the, uh, the amount of organizations that find us as an organization, be aware we do not actively recruit because we're too small as an organization and we lack stable funding for the moment so we do not have the luxury to just go out and say hey join us but they the, the organizations find us so that's indicative for um, for the willingness to exchange and the willingness to learn from each other and to move forward on a European level I have to say that as far as I know there is very little uh, exchange on the uh, mm -hmm. on the topic mm -hmm. for me as as a part of Globlink, it's like um we wrote the report for the next four years on which we're going to work um and it's more specific as ever that we're going to take the role of like a learning network um and that we as as i can say a good example uh, on how to work sustainable it's it's our duty to 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 share those examples not that we're perfect by far, but we we have the responsibility to take that role in the network, and I think that's a network in Flanders and Brussels, but beyond. So um, I think we're we have the the character of being shy and and not being able to say like what we did, like those examples. My God, they worked, and actually copy them, do do what we do because it worked. We're always trying to be so creative and to be, um, we're, we're not being so eager to, to learn from each other, but it's so simple, just, just share the information and you have actually less work, so it benefits all. <laughs> I think um, considering again the, the variety of youth associations that we have, um, what, what we see a little bit is that there is cooperation, but more on the level of those um, associations which are kind of close to one another anyway, concerning the topics that they deal with. So let's say the traditional green associations, they of course have more cooperation, they have more to do uh, with one another, they, they make uh, joint events. Um, and uh, between others, not so much. So I think it's a bit unevenly distributed the level of cooperation and um, yeah again talking about the youth sector in general youth movements included um, this is something where we uh, could make a big step forward I think mm -hmm. okay let's move to a new topic and with a new topic comes a new Mentimeter so please Darko come over here <laughs> take your smartphones and in a minute we'll see the next question So the second Mentimeter question relates to uh, competencies and know-how. And the question is, do you feel you have sufficient know-how to promote sustainability within your youth work context? And I'm very curious to hear your answers or to see them appearing on our screen. Okay. So a few people say no. Fortunately, some people also say yes. A lot of people are doubting, they are not sure. Oh wow, and this group is even growing bigger and I think we will end up with this ex -equal. So the people who say yes and those who say I'm not sure are uh, as many. 
Okay, I hope the four people in the panel would all say yes, <laughs> because you are actually doing already so much. Um, but of course, I would like to hear your, uh, your opinion. Do you feel that youth workers, people in the youth work field, have, enough, have the right know-how, um, that they know how to deal with this topic in, in the right way, the most efficient or most effective way? Um, maybe Esther, you as a youth work trainer can say something mm. about it. Yeah, so in, in my opinion and for, for what I hear, um, there's not enough uh, know-how in general. Of course, there are experts out there, but, uh, but there's a, a big need for capacity building on, on this topic. Um, I, I have a, a wide network of other trainers uh, which are specialized in other topics. And uh, I see constantly like their calls and their messages saying, hey, uh, I need some training on this, where can I get some? And uh, it's funny because there's not that much out there, there's not that many resources uh, for getting a, a complete like overview on how you can train on environmental topics or how you can organize a, a European project more sustainably. Um, five years ago, uh, Youth and Environment Europe organized a training for eco-trainers. Uh, it was for eco-trainers and project managers and I was one of the trainers in the team, we had around 500 applicants and of course there was only space for like 30 people and it was a training which, which had a big impact and uh, the, the actual participants then became um, eco-trainers themselves, uh, so multiplying the, the knowledge that they gained. I don't know for what reason there are not more of these trainings because I do see the need. Uh, so, um, well, yeah, I think this is something that is going to start uh, happening from now on because the, I think now I'm not the only one thinking that this is uh, needed. So, um, hopefully there will be more trainings for eco-trainers. Uh, also, um, yeah, I have a list here of uh, other like ideas on how somebody can uh, improve their knowledge or their capacity on, on these topics. And there are, for example, some very good um, online trainings by the United Nations Environmental Program. So that's a way for maybe, um, yeah, like designing your educational path a, a little bit and deciding mm -hmm. what, um, what is exactly what you want to train yourself on. Uh, there's a, a website, uh, ecoliteracy.org, Mm, there's a lot of resources there for educators uh, f to work on sustainable development and the environmental education topics. There's uh, the Green Toolbox developed by International Young Nature Friends. Um, yeah, uh, that's mm, basically it. I think it's, it's more about uh, right now because there's nothing established which officially trains you for this, then it's about creating your own educational path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The last thing you, that you said to me, it's like know-how is important, but the most important thing is that you can learn it and you can learn it also on the job. And it's like, listen to the youngsters, for example, um, because it's all about analyzing the context and we can all do it as a human being, more or less, I assume, um, and then work towards an action. Um, but yeah, to, to get back to the, the last question, it's also about sharing that expertise. And if we keep on um, keeping that information to ourselves, then we, we cannot build the network of the know-how. Um, but to me, most importantly, I'm already almost 10 years a youth worker, you learn on the job and you have to have like an inner enthusiasm, which I think I have, to, to get the, the know-how. It, it won't come to you as yourself. So you have to be driven by yourself and then hopefully by your organization. Um, but you have a responsibility to get to know how yourself. Is the mic still on? Yes. Is the mic still works. on? Yeah. Yeah, just to, just to add um, one more point, um, because uh, in some conversations that we had before this this topic um, popped up, that v very often um, there's this feeling that maybe youth workers also set a very high bar for themselves. So there's this feeling that oh, I have to be, you know, I, I have to know about the technical details of climate change and have to know all the little things there are to know. Um, 
when you know in in reality i mean uh, we our department is the department for sustainability so thinking about you know i think people often forget that sustainability um as as a term um is not only climate change but also a lot of other factors so diversity um, poverty all those things that uh, youth associations deal with since ages and actually they are um, experts in that and they are doing this um, with or without the label of education for sustainable development so some are actually doing a work that is you know, education for sustainable development without using that term. And they are absolute experts on this. So yeah, maybe in some context, um, it gets too much pinpoint to this oh, technical knowledge about climate change. Yeah, I, I concur. We, uh, the, the whole sustainability topic is sometimes super complex and it changes all of the times, especially when you look to more like technical things like energy transition and mobility. Um, it's impossible to be an expert in this. I think the, the, the organizations we work with, I think their main concern should be becoming a process uh, manager um, and finding the right people who do have the knowledge and matching that, having having a trainer assist you to do things you, you can't do yourself, having other organizations like Clublink who uh, start cooperations with organizations who need to train their uh, young people who they, they reach out to. Um, and it's yeah, it's it's a matter of, of joining forces and being complementary to each other. And then you have exactly the uh, the fact that youth work has been uh, and always has had a transition of being socially sustainable, being economically sustainable. Mostly uh, when you look at, at fair pay and and dynamic work schedules and um, uh, resources. Youth work is especially, I'm, I can't speak for other European countries, but in Flanders it's on the forefront when it comes to um, innovative um, organization models. Youth work is there and that's part of social and ecology, uh, economical sustainability. And we, we can be proud of that, but we rarely are. Mm -hmm. As Finn mentioned, you can learn a lot of things on the job, but a question is, shouldn't be more attention be paid to sustainability in youth workers uh, educational pathways so before people become a youth worker most of most in most countries there is some kind of training pathway um, is there already attention being given to this in, in your context and should more be done there good question <laughs> um, <coughs> Yeah, if I, um, I'm thinking about this. I think um, we, something, I mean, there, there has to be, of course, a, a basic knowledge um, about, you know, sustainable topics and also maybe uh, climate uh, technical issues. But um, I think one thing that we have to be very careful of is this exact argument that young people or the youth workers themselves, you know, they need that expert knowledge in order to voice their concerns. That's actually, actually something that, you know, some uh, German politicians like to say, oh, you know, climate change is a thing for experts. So get out of my way um, in order to uh, silence young people's voices effectively. So um, I think what we have to put a focus on is, uh, do we need a, a basic understanding? Yes, <laughs> would be would be good. Um, but maybe even more um, young people have to learn how to voice their demands and how to um, maybe also negotiate in a political conversation. So I would argue that a child even, like, I don't know how many years, but let's just say a young child is also able to say, I want to live in a world where my, you know, basic conditions like food, water, safety, uh, and a bearable outer temperature are not at stake. And that's something a child can, can voice. And the uh, job of the politicians is to get the expert counseling and to put this into practice. So. Um, that's just something that I thought about. We have to be to be careful to um, not set the stakes so high, or we have to be the experts at this um, and, and kind of take away our own right of participation through that. Yeah, actually, I agree because um, I think we have to make the translation of the 
the back adults' words about the SDGs, like actually to me the SDGs when you translate it to the, the youngsters environment is just being a person in the society, you go to work or you go to school, like okay, you can decide how you're gonna, how you're gonna go to school, that's being active uh, citizenship, wow, such a word. Um, and you can make sustainable choices, but it's then actually you're working on sustainable development, but you, you don't have a clue. So that's why we need to have the focus, as you said, on voicing young people. It's simple as that, but it's, it's, it's a basic thing, but they, they, they make it so large, so complex, they make it rocket science, but sustainable development is being to me, active in society. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> okay, An another um, issue which has been raised already in the other uh, sessions is that um, while many young people um, are uh, interested in the topic, um, certainly not all young people are. Um, uh, yeah, some young people might want to contribute but do not feel included. Um, they think that sustainability is something for the rich kids. So the question is then, what is the role of youth work here? Um, is, it, is it the task of youth work to broaden up this, this discussion and also bring in new groups to reach, reach out to new or different uh, groups of young people, according to you? Um, who wants to take this first? I think this is a really good question because actually uh, I talked about this with uh, some of the youth associations and they see this as a true challenge. So how do we reach people who are not naturally drawn to the mm -hmm. topic? And um, yeah, some, some thoughts that we had about this was that it might be um, a good way to enable different forms of, of activism. Um, and practical actions, so not everyone necessarily feels like it's their way of, of participating to go on the street. Maybe for some that feels too too radical, too loud, too much. Um, so to enable different forms, like maybe through art or you know making music, poetry, um, there are different forms. You said it also before, so many different forms of participation. And then something um, that might sound kind of basic, but I really think it's it's an important thing. Uh, I said it before, I think um, for young people, I mean, we, we can look at the psychological studies that are um, being made about how young people feel about, you know, again, talking about the climate crisis, how, um, how they feel about it. And I, th I think for so many young people, this is just such a frustrating and, and negative and uh, burdening thing to think about. And it weighs them down. It, it leads in some ways to stagnation and not participating at all. So what I think, and again, this sounds rather simple, but I think it's really important, is we have to think about making, when we make uh, activities and um, practices, we have to focus on making them fun, on focusing them on empowerment, on community sense, and, um, you know, um, have a sense of, of fun and beauty in those uh, activities, because only through that do people um, get engaged in a sustainable manner and feel like they can change something, have a feeling of self-efficacy and um, stay in, um, in the engagement, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Like, um, for example, I keep on using the same example, but, but the SEGs, they are so complex. But for example, what we did, we made an a, a escape room out of it. And we just go to local groups. Uh, we just say like, okay, stay where you are. We're gonna lock you in a room. Um, and we're gonna, first of all, have one hour of fun. Um, and in the meantime, they get to know all the things about the SDGs, but not in like a formal way, like, okay, now we're gonna talk about SDG one. Um, no, it doesn't work with youth work. Um, it doesn't work in, in all kinds of ways. Um, but to me, or to Globelink, it's important, be where youngsters are, and there are youngsters are everywhere, but it's um, too arrogant to think that youngsters will find organizations as us, we have to, work out regent, we have to um, not only go to cities, we have to go to rural areas. Um, we cannot reach them during the day, okay, then we're gonna go in the evenings and during the weekends. Um, it, it's, a, it's a mind shift to me that you um, have to 
you have to listen to the youngsters, you have to um, listen to their energy level. Um, and yeah, do it in fun ways, as you said, that's so important. Um, and, and youngsters are everywhere, they're, they're kids over there. We can ask them about their dreams. What do they wanna change about this public space? Um, it, it, it starts with small things, small questions, and then we can go on, and then we can make it less technical. Um, but start with the beginning, be there where youngsters are. So yeah, I thought I had nothing to contribute to this question, but actually, thanks to your to one of your comments, uh, Christina, I uh, I think it's really fundamental that um, that we provide mental support, mental health, and well-being support to young people because some of them might not be active and might not be wanting to engage simply because they are depressed. They are. Um, they have suffered a lot of eco-anxiety and other sorts of anxieties for too long and, uh, and now they are completely deactivated, they are stagnant. So, um, so I think uh, this um, health, con like mental control, no, not mental control, how do you say, mental well-being, um, prevention and, uh, and control is really, really fundamental also to, to mm. make them able to actually participate in whatever they, they would want to. Uh, for me, and I'm, I'm speaking from the, the network organization perspective, uh, for me the, the, the trick is in diversity and in cooperation. Again, um, may, kind of give an example, a museum which is part of the, the heritage sector in Belgium can have a social program reaching out to people living in poverty. If you can combine that with a youth work organization that can do a project together, you get an organization that reaches these families, but who can also use the youth work methodology to bring in the sustainability issue and therefore creating intersections and thus enlarging the audience you're reaching. Audiences the, the youth work organization wasn't reaching before, but they do have the knowledge how to work with, these, uh, with this topic and with these groups. Um, and I think that's key in the whole thing. That's also why we, uh, as a network organization includes these different domains of uh, cultural agents. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sad to say that we are approaching the end of this session, but we have one more Mentimeter. So please take your smartphones. And Darko is running again. <laughs> And the question this time is, <laughs> it's on the, yeah, the future agenda. Um, so what should be, according to you, the Youth Works future, future agenda on sustainability? And um, you have uh, two choices, well, actually three, um, which you will see in the Mentimeter. So, should youth work, according to you, focus on educating non, uh, young people in a non-formal way, thus enabling young people's sustainable behavior? Or should youth work um, support young people in realizing systemic change towards a more sustainable society? So, um, yeah, look, work on a very different level. Or should youth work focus on both? Okay, and it's like very likely that we will have consensus. Oh no, at least one person wants to focus on sy systemic change only. But apart from that, most people think both approaches are equally important. But quite clear is already that the first choice is not an option for all of you. Okay, that's interesting to see. So, we turn to the panel, okay. Is this what you expected and does this also reflect your views? What should be, okay, Finn. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy this is the yeah. outcome actually because it, it is a systemic problem. Um, but we are individuals living in this system. 
So it needs to be both changed on a behavioral level as on a systemic thing. And these two things communicate. Uh, by changing your behavior, you influence the system to, be, to changing as well. And by changing the system, behavior gets influenced. So it has to be both. It doesn't necessarily have to be both within the same organization or within the same target audience, um, but it has to be both. Um, and some organizations will be able to work towards a systemic change because they are positioned uh, and are able to influence policymakers or uh, even industries, um, and some aren't, and they will work on a, on a micro personal level, and that's also equally important. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the, the answer is easy, both. Always. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely both. Uh, the, of course, the the one. The, so the the biggest leverage uh, point. Uh, in the system would be to really uh, change the system itself. So, uh, but of course, uh, as Finn was saying, it's uh, the system is also composed by individuals. So, if individuals change, so uh, for, to me, both things uh, need to happen at the same time. Mm. Yeah, I can only agree as well, um, because in most cases, education for sustainable development has the active parts already kind of implemented and should ideally be a transformative education. So an education that leads people towards changing uh, the structures and, and um, teaching them about changing societal, political structures as well. So um, yeah, fully agree on this. I, I think what is also very important and which hasn't been discussed, I think, or maybe I missed it <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> could, could be that I just zoned out, um, but is making visible, trying to make visible what is already happening. One of the biggest thresholds in people changing their behaviors is thinking, oh, I'm alone. I'm the only one doing this. Whereas you can lead by example, that, that has been mentioned, but actually showing it, make it visible, and a lot of sustainable choices, especially ecologically sustainable choices, are invisible. But talking about them, showing them, mentioning in your communication, uh, that helps. It starts a public dialogue where people see, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one doing this, this thing. And one of the most plain sees is bringing like a water bottle. At some point, everybody in the organization will, will be carrying a water bottle. It's the pioneers that go like, why are you bringing a water bottle? Uh, bottled water is, is perfectly fine. Tap water is, 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 is yuck. Whereas the first one who does it, he opens the door, and after a while, everybody will hopefully bring a water bottle. OK. Who wants to have the final word here? Or was that the final word? We all bring our water bottle. Perfect. Okay, then there is now a bit of room for questions, and I see the arm of Sophie raising already. So, Sophie, you're the first one. Does it work? You hear me? Okay. It works. Yeah, I know there is always uh, not a lot of time for questions, so that's why I, I want to take this this opportunity because, um, as youth work organizations. I like we are an umbrella organization for youth work in Flanders and we hear a lot of times like we don't want to take the lead in going green because that's not our core task we are not funded for that and in addition uh, there are climate NGOs such as WWF or Greenpeace so um, and these kind of organization they they have an image that we don't want necessarily to take upon us um, because we want to be an open and accessible organization for all and this image or reputation sometimes is overwhelming for youngsters that we try to reach so I, I'm my question is like how do you, how do we have to deal with this do you have an idea and and yeah how do we deal that we can be proactive and take a clear position in the debate, in the climate debate, without um, getting this stamp of being an activistic climate organization. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Christina? Okay, I, um, my first thought was, um, um, well, not, not sounding too, too harsh on this, um, but those uh, youth associations who, you know, 
kind of try to, to, to push this topic a little bit aside. I'm wondering, um, are they listening to young people? I mean, uh, it's if, if you, uh, if, if an organization um, presents itself as, um, you know, the, the, the representation of young people or spokesperson for young people, uh, we have to take their topic seriously. So that would be probably the first thing that I would say to them, look at the top themes that are important for young people and you can't really get around uh, sustainability or climate change because this is just the huge deal for them and um, as, a, as a youth organization uh, you should follow along on that I think. And also there's nothing wrong being, you cannot be too sustainable I think. So yeah, what's the worst thing you can get that you are called being hippies or something uh, because you have vegetarian meals and you, uh, take, in, you take into account the, the, the electricity bill? I, I, don't, I don't really get it, like why organizations don't, they, they, they are so hesitant to, to take, yeah, to take the lead in it, but I, I, I don't get it. I was also <laughs> waiting my words, but, um, yeah, I think it's just you as, an, as a person, but also as an organization are part of a society. And if you, you follow like, for example, digital um, elements and digital um, new elements. So why not go on the transmission of sustainable topics? For me, the, the need to strive for sustainability is so fundamental and so evident that I, I just, I don't uh, understand why anyone would hesitate doing something for it. Because it's like, we either do that or we, we are heading to collapse. Because, I mean, economic uh, growth uh, and like the, the way in which everything is, is now working is not sustainable. It's, uh, we, we have to, uh, to change um, the way in which we do things and the way. So, uh, I mean, I, for me, it's not a question. I mean, uh, what if somebody uh, then says, okay, uh, are they crazy or are they too radical or are they what? So what? I mean, you need to do what you, what you know that you have to do, uh, and regardless of what other people might say, right? So. Mm. Okay, let's move on to, there are other questions. I think I saw, seen your hand first, please. One minute, there is a, a mic on the way, yeah. Um, I just thought that the, the last slide, I think, needed an, another bullet that you, that you all mentioned. And for me, it was similar with the Black Lives Matters movement as well, after work, years of working on, on anti-racism, mm -hmm. that suddenly it became a thing and young people sort of stepped up and, and, and they took over. And I think there's a time where youth workers just need to take a step back and just make the drinks, you know, and shut the fuck up, to be honest. And I think there's a really important role there and to see at that moment is a learning moment for us as well as you know, you know what was it that mobilized what works what tools are they using and and just to learn and and really just shut up at that moment mm, thank you i've seen another hand i think claudius you had a question as well yes um um, I understood. I have understood uh, Sophie's questions a little bit different. I think we should make a difference here between striving for sustainability, sustainability as an organization, or really taking the lead in, for example, making uh, education for climate change and so on and so on. And here, I w the question for me is really, for example, the, the regional youth council of North Rhine Westphalia. I mean, you have to cover so many topics that are relevant for the youth sector. Is it really your task to take the lead in uh, climate change education and so on? Uh, Why there, there are other organizations like uh, Greenpeace, uh, German Watch, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Maybe a brief reaction and then there is a final yeah. question over there. Okay. Um, how do I make this quick? Well, <laughs> um, the best way I can put this is um, this is actually not my choice to make <laughs> because I, I mean, the way we are structured, we have a democratic structure and basically um, I am the executive of what our youth associations tell us to do. So when the plenary assembly says, um, 
you know, we want to be the leading part of the uh, sustainability movement, then uh, we have to be the ones making that possible. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a, a question who wants to do that. And if our youth associations want that, then we will, uh, yeah, apply this at our work. <laughs> okay. And then the last question there. It's another reflection, but actually on this, the same point, I, I mean, I agree with, with what Maria has, has said there. And it, this, this discussion reminded me of you know, a similar sort of dilemma within uh, the environmental movement when, when um, uh, the young people started to strike and, and what, what's the relationship between NGOs and, and social movements, you know? And, and so um, I think we need to think about how do we sort of act in symbiosis rather than uh, expecting that NGOs can perform the role of a movement and, and vice versa. You know, the NGOs give, give um, institutional knowledge, have access to resources, certain amount of depth, and then the movements give breadth, give visibility to an issue. Uh, and so they play very different roles within the sort of wider ecosystem of, of civil society. Thank you. So one of the good things about live events is that we can continue this discussion over, over the meal and, and, and the next day in the morning. Um, thank you so much for your attention, um, and please a warm applause for our four panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and one applause to Rilke, of course, uh, for excellent uh, moderation. <laughs>